Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Doug Sparks. I'm from the uh, University of Waterloo um, with the uh, Conrad Business Entrepreneurship and Technology Center, which is part of engineering. I'll get into that a little bit uh, later. Uh, currently, I'm uh, the uh, Associate Director for Undergrad Programs and uh, hoping in the not too distant future to be promoted back to just professor. Um, so when I was uh, invited to give this uh, talk, I was sort of admit uh, first few seconds were uh, uh, moments of panic, uh, well, you know, what will I talk about? And so I uh, started to reflect on what have we been doing at Waterloo for the last 20 years around entrepreneurship? So I sort of started thinking about that and came up with the idea of, well, maybe I'll talk a bit about sort of the, the journey that at least myself have gone, uh, gone through in terms of uh, creating entrepreneurship education and, and programs at Waterloo. So to start off with, maybe a, a little bit about uh, the University of Waterloo. Uh, so we're uh, approximately an hour southwest of uh, Toronto, Ontario. Uh, if you're not familiar with Canadian geography, uh, it's about two hours sort of north of uh, Detroit or an hour and a half sort of west of uh, Buffalo. And uh, it's uh, Canada's largest engineering school. Uh, we have a rivalry with the University of Toronto. We outnumber them in, uh, in students. They outnumber us in, uh, in faculty, but you know, the students pay the money. So um, it's also uh, a very uh, vibrant um, startup community, a uh, startup ecosystem. It's a uh, home of some of, Canada, some of Canada's uh, largest technology companies. Probably the best known is uh, uh, in the rise and fall of uh, BlackBerry. Uh, you know, so you know, it's, it's uh, actually came out of the University of Waterloo. Uh, it's also uh, home to a lot of other Canadian uh, tech companies like uh, Open Text and also a lot of uh, manufacturing. We are a big manufacturing center in the automotive industry and in sort of heavy engineering. Uh, it's also uh, an interesting ecosystem in that there's a, a number of universities within sort of a half hour radius. There, there's three universities, there's the University of Waterloo, University of Guelph, Wilfrid Laurier University, and then a polytechnic, uh, Conestoga College. So it's a very high density of, of students. We probably, in the order of 100,000 students within that, that radius. So it's, it's, the University of Water, Waterloo itself is around 36,000 students, but each of those universities is fairly uh, large. Uh, within, as I said, we're, we're Canada's largest uh, engineering school, but also it's probably the highest concentration of computer science and math students within the country. So it's, it's very, uh, we're, we're very much a techie kind of place. It's also among the highest startup densities globally. Uh, we're, one report that I uh, saw recently rated as second to Silicon Valley in terms of startups per capita kind of thing. So there are a lot of startup companies in that area. And it, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about today was exploring a little bit of why is that the case. So one of the things about the University of Waterloo, it's, uh, is when it was founded in 1957, it started from way, uh, day one sort of saying, okay, experiential education is, ex is important to us. It's around what we call co-op. So uh, we're the largest co-op program of its type in the world. Uh, at any particular term, we have between eight and 10,000 students out on work placements. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the way co-op works, um, students do an academic term, then they go out and work for a company for four months, then they come back do another uh, academic term, and so that goes back and forth. So if you're in engineering, uh, co-op is mandatory. So you, you must take part in co-op, and uh, co-op is uh, assessed and, and evaluated. So you know you get, um, if you go out on a co-op term and you get a very bad evaluation from the uh, employer, that shows up in the, in, in the system. Um, you also do work term reports and things like that. So it's, it's not sort of a freebie going out there. It has a couple of major impacts, uh, and one of them I'll talk about in a minute, but the other uh, is uh, in terms of uh, student debt. It, most engineering students come out of Waterloo fairly debt free. Uh, my older son just graduated a couple of years ago and his big decision was whether to buy a car or open an RSP, which is, uh, I'm not sure what the American equivalent of that is here, but um, so it, it creates, uh, you know, the, we're talking about employment that generates a lot of revenue in the, in the student population as well. <clears throat> so in thinking about this, uh, sort of looking at it in terms of my own sort of experiential journey going through this over the last 20 years, 
uh, thinking about, okay, how has this system evolved over, the, over that period of time? You know, when you think of it from a sort of a socio-political economic system, it's evolved quite a bit over the last 20 years. And sort of what are some of the points in there? So I started to think about, well, what are some of the major events that took place uh, within that ecosystem? And so I sort of laid it out as a bit of a timeline to start thinking about it. And so you now I'd like to sort of go through that timeline and give some idea of you know, what were some of the, the major events. So one of the things, just because it's fun to say right now, at the turn of the century, it makes it sound you know, so, so old, uh, you know, there wasn't really much around in KW, uh, the Kitchener-Waterloo area or Waterloo region, or whatever you call it, uh, to support entrepreneurship. We had uh, very little in the way of uh, uh, sort of formal support. Uh, there were a few courses. I would define them as sort of the, the classical um, entrepreneurship style course. I think there was, there was actually two on campus at the time. Uh, they typically were, you know, you get a student, uh, tell them, you know, create a business plan around an idea and give them a bunch of, of lectures and things like that. But really it was about, you know, what is entrepreneurship? It's not really about creating entrepreneurs or supporting entrepreneurs. <clears throat> you know, so the, the uh, you know, and the typical evaluation, to be honest, was more about writing skills, which are important, and did they have the parts of a business plan? Not really, did the business plan really amount to anything? Also, we had a tech, uh, TTLO, or Tech Transfer and Licensing Office. Again, uh, one of the interesting things about Waterloo is it has uh, a creator's own intellectual property. So the university has no rights on my uh, intellectual property. So if I come up with an idea or an invention, it's mine to do whatever I want. I can take the option, uh, well, with the uh, caveat that if it's contract research and there's an agreement in place, then that governs the intellectual property. But if that's not in place, then uh, I, have the, I have the choice of whether to patent it myself or to go through the tech transfer office. If it goes through the tech transfer office, uh, the university takes a share and I get a share, you know, all that type of stuff. But the reality is a lot of faculty and grad students do it themselves, right? So they, there's quite a, a knowledge base amongst the faculty uh, on how, sort of how to do this kind of thing. Uh, there was also sort of limited support in the region. There was uh, things like <clears throat> uh, business development offices uh, for the cities, but really they were interested in how do we uh, attract the uh, next Toyota plant or how do we get uh, an aerospace company to come into the region, stuff like that. They weren't really focused on what's going on in terms of creating entrepreneurship. Uh, there was also some government programs. Uh, the federal government had some programs to encourage research and development, and they had some small pots of money to encourage uh, commercialization of that. There was other uh, groups like uh, small business centers and things like that, but nothing really in a, in a large sort of uh, sense. And then, uh, but at the same time, there, there was a beginning of a realization that there's something happening here. Or that, you know, there was the typical reaction, uh, something's happening, we don't know what it is, but we better find out and control it. You know, so uh, fortunately, we, we sidestepped the control it part, but we started to understand what actually is going on. This is uh, from some work that a grad student, Stephen Zhu, did for uh, his supervisor was Rod McNaughton. And he used uh, data from a PWC to sort of map out what had been going on from 1900 up to 2000. And uh, although this chart doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense just looking at it, around the periphery here we have companies that uh, came into the region or, or, or developed in the region that had no relationship to the universities at all. This particular node is the University of Waterloo. This particular one is the University of Guelph. Guelph is a bit younger than Waterloo, so it's uh, 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 sort of evolving at a different rate. But when you put this in terms of an animation, what you sort of begin to see is a very slow sort of takeoff. Then around the time that Waterloo was created, it starts to go exponential. There's a lot of activity going on, a lot of sp spin-offs coming out of uh, the university, a lot of uh, uh, not just uh, sort of technology transfer, but people transfer, you know, people going between companies and stuff. So it really starting to sort of integrate up. Uh, so, you know, the, as I said, you know, we, we, we started off with uh, this phenomenon that we created at the start uh, around co-op, around experiential education. 
And it's a strong belief in, in the university. All of the programs, not just engineering, but through all the faculties, uh, whether it's the faculty of math and computer science or engineering or arts, have experiential, experiential education and uh, the co-op programs embedded into them. A another sort of interesting sidebar around Waterloo is we don't actually have a business school, although we're one of the largest <laughs> business programs in the country. And the reason for that is what you find in each of the faculties is that the business programs are embedded in the faculty. So you would have arts and business, science and business, environment and business. So they, they're all sort of uh, in their own sort of uh, uh, technical domains, for lack of a better word. And so you get students coming out who have business skills and technical depth at the same time. And this plays into uh, uh, sort of the whole entrepreneurship ecosystem uh, type thing. So with a, largest, a large number of students going out, it's embedded into different programs, and it sets the entrepreneurial stage in a way. Because what ends up happening is you have students who go out, uh, they've had some uh, experience, uh, business training, so on, they go out, they work in their placements, they see opportunities, they see problems, they see issues that are in the workplace, they come back into the university, they share it with their friends, they, it ends up being uh, uh, work term reports, case studies, uh, discussions, uh, they, but they also start to recognize opportunities. So they see opportunities to maybe uh, pursue it as, as their own business idea. So you start to see this, this uh, sort of dynamic system start to emerge where you have students as they're going through their programs, getting deeper and deeper uh, technical knowledge, seeing opportunities, uh, having access to sort of the social networks that allow them to draw in others to uh, help them in their projects and so on. And so you start to see this sort of loop uh, starting to, to generate startups. So what we found was that, uh, especially in engineering, we had this situation where uh, you have students who uh, must go out on co-op terms because they have to get credit for them to get their engineering degree. So you have to do five of six terms to do a, uh, your engineering degree. You have to have co-op credit for them. And we had these students who wanted to go out and do their own thing. They wanted to start their own business, whether it's a, a startup uh, for uh, uh, a software business or a hardware business, uh, sort of, I've seen like automated vending machines, uh, uh, different robotics applications, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, drones, all kinds of different types of technologies that undergrad students are trying to commercialize on their own. And so, as I mentioned before, we didn't really have any structure for that, so we created Enterprise Co-op, where these students could go out and do this during their co-op terms in a, a mentored environment. So, you know, sort of a safe place to fail kind of idea. So rather than just letting them go loose, we would put criteria in place to track them, make sure they were working on it so that they could legitimately get their co-op credit and at the same time be legitimately working on their business ideas. So, you know, this is started around 2000, is still in place today, and actually it was the beginning of sort of a, a, a process where we started building continually around that. At the same, around the same time, we also tried a bit of an experiment in what we called UW Innovate. We set up a, a program, it was out of the Office of Research at the time, whose basic idea was let's help, uh, initially the idea was we'll help faculty and staff uh, commercialize ideas. You know, they, were, they were recognizing that a lot of them aren't going through the tech transfer office, but is there something we can do to help them out? And th the general philosophy there was, you know, uh, and uh, Blackberry is a perfect example of this, they take off, uh, maybe we, they didn't sort of pay money back into the university, but when you look at the payback to the university in terms of co-op jobs, the Perimeter Institute, the Institute for Quantum Physics, all these different uh, philanthropic uh, things that came back to the university from them, uh, you know, it's paid off quite a bit. The issue is, you know, how many of those do you generate a, a every decade kind of thing. So we wanted to experiment with how do we support these guys? Because as I mentioned before, we, we knew something was happening, but what do we do about it? <coughs> uh, so we, we continued with the development of Enterprise Co-op. We also started putting in place what we called boot camps, where they were a week-long, very intensive uh, programs where you came in and we worked with them on uh, helping their business development ideas. And 
a couple of features about Enterprise Co-op and the boot camps were that you had to be interviewed into them. You didn't just sort of sign up for them. You had to demonstrate that you had a business idea. We wanted to know what it was. Uh, and part of the, the, the issue there in both Enterprise Co-op and the boot camps is that we design the programs around you. Uh, so we start to bring in, uh, for example, if we had a boot camp that was a lot of software guys, we would bring in lawyers, accountants, all these other people, but specifically talking about the issues that that particular group was dealing with. So it was very much trying to go down the path of just-in-time learning, right? What they needed when they needed it. Uh, so we, 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 we started off thinking that this would be mostly faculty and grad students. Uh, predictably, it ended up being dominated by undergrad students. You know, them, uh, the, the, the sort of the thirst for information, wanting to know uh, how do I do these things. I and mean, also, uh, it, it became a, a mechanism to encourage uh, uh, sort of support networks to form around these ventures. So we, the, this whole idea that uh, as you're developing and you start to need access to lawyers and accountants and all these other things, this became the place where you started to have to, uh, to meet with them. So I'm going to have to speed up a little bit here. I get carried away with my story. Um, <coughs> so uh, some of the things we learned there was, first of all, the amount of uh, activity at the undergrade level. It, it's sort of the surprises. I, I remember one meeting sort of I, I was sort of uh, the only person there in, uh, in the program, and I, you know, I, it seemed like I was drinking from a fire hose. It was just like constantly coming uh, at you. Some of the things I started to understand was, and it, it reflected about it on the uh, Tuesday morning uh, uh, activity, was around the cultural differences between engineers and business and math and engineers and computer science, you know, just different people trying to get them to work together. Also helped us uh, understand how do we develop sort of processes and some tools to help these guys uh, move their ideas along. Uh, we, we sort of underlined the idea of just-in-time learning and important to focus on the learner. What is it that they need to do, uh, need to know when they need to know it? And uh, a focus not just on sort of the academic side, but a lot of focus on sort of things like motivation and self-efficacy and those kind of things. How do we get them to believe in themselves and how do we get them to move forward? And uh, I used to joke around that uh, I felt like I was more like Dr. Phil than anything else. Uh, you know, I'd be dealing with these kids and sort of trying to help them get through some of the more emotional sides of trying to start their own businesses, the ups and the downs and the failures. <clears throat> and this whole thing, became sort of linked back into experiential education. You know, the, the, there was a, a comment made on uh, Tuesday about you know, learning to swim from a book. Uh, it's the same kind of hearing, thing here. To, to, to really develop entrepreneurship education and learning, you have to experience it as well as just sort of read about it. <clears throat> so I, I have here a little bit of a, you know, sort of um, where our ventures come from. Uh, this is all the different faculties. The vast majority come out of math, computer science, and engineering, but we do have them coming from arts and from applied health studies and others. Recently, we've moved more into the biomedical area as a university, so I expect to see this start to shift a little more as you get sort of medical type uh, ventures emerging. The other thing that was interested, interesting, and this comes back later on in terms of how we set up our, uh, our programming, is uh, we did a survey of the students that had gone through Enterprise Co-op. And, you know, it's not a case of they do their work term and then forget about it. They continue to work on them while, while they're in, in back in class. And so, you know, we had a fairly large percentage of them that were spending more than 20 hours a week running their businesses in addition to going through engineering. And when you look at it in terms of their, their grade performance, predictably, they're not necessarily at the top of the class. And so you get this question, are, are they overachievers or underperformers? Uh, you know, sort of from some aspects, people will view them as underperformers. But from my point of view, the fact that they're making their way through and running a full-time business puts them into a different category. Uh, then uh, later on, we started to form the, what initially was called CBET, the Center for Business, Entrepreneurship, and Technology. Uh, later on, we uh, became known as the Conrad Center because we had a, a donation and a naming opportunity. But we're part of the engineering faculty, and we, we started off with a master's program, which is purposely different than what you might find in an MBA. You might find some of the courses with the same names, but what we try to do is position ourselves between a business program and an incubator. And so 
we're structured very differently. We're structured around the ventures that are coming through the program and providing uh, uh, sort of laid out the courses in such a way of what you would need to know at, er, at the beginning stages, mid stages and late stages and trying to help these guys move their business ideas along. Uh, eventually, uh, we moved out of the basement of the admin building, which is a true startup story, and moved into a nice new building up on, the, on what we call the North Campus, which we are on the second floor. The first floor is a, an actual accelerator space where we have uh, space for companies to actually uh, develop. And again, as sort of reflecting our, our learning going along, we, we've very much tried to stay with this idea of, of, of integrating academics with experiential education. This is just one example of uh, some students uh, through the MBET program. This is uh, Ali Esmail. He's actually an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. He decided to take a year off and come to MBET because uh, he was starting a business, uh, Kronos Health, which uh, provides uh, uh, IT support for surgeries, uh, for surgery scheduling and stuff like that. And uh, it's actually implemented in hospitals in Manitoba now. Uh, if you don't know where Manitoba is, fly north for three hours and then uh, hang a, a, a left for a couple more. Anyways, uh, they, he met the VJ uh, at Embet and he, uh, they became partners. VJ is the CTO, Ali is the medical guru, and they've started another company now uh, called uh, PopRx. And here they are pitching on what we call Dragon's Den, which in the States is Shark. Shark Tank, I think, you know, same, some of the same characters on both. So, you know, that this company they got invested in and they're launching that one now. So he's, uh, Ali's gone from being a surgeon to a serial entrepreneur. I, I don't know if he's still doing surgery or not. Uh, knowing him, he probably is. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's taking a different angle. <clears throat> Around the same time, uh, you start to see infrastructure developing. We had uh, the growth of Communitech, which is a uh, a community-based organization. We have uh, Velocity, which is uh, uh, an, ex uh, an incubator space for student startups. So uh, this is a, a picture of some of the space. We've, we've refurbished uh, some of the old um, uh, manufacturing space in the, in the downtown core and turned it into uh, uh, this type of space and it's co-located with companies like Google and, and Facebook and guys like that. So it's, it's quite an interesting uh, dynamic environment. Um, so, it, so you start to see the emergence of this infrastructure to support them and, and, and a supply or a, sort of a, a, a supply chain, if you will, uh, where you have support right now from, from concept uh, all the way through to uh, sort of later around financing. It, you know, there's still uh, the, 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 the major issue in Canada has always been sort of large scale venture capital and that, that still exists, but that's something that seems to be evolving as well. Uh, along the same time, we started experimenting with uh, uh, distance education around it. And the first thing we looked at was CAFE. Uh, it was actually a joint with uh, UAE uh, supporting female entrepreneurship. Uh, we found a, lot, a number of issues around that with engagement and collaboration, but also geopolitics. Uh, the Canadian government and the UAE got their elbows up and that ended the program. Uh, but nothing to do with us. Um, and then uh, we also started a program called JAMI, which we'll be talking about uh, tomorrow, which we've, uh, again, using for supporting uh, uh, distance education and entrepreneurship. And we've done a couple of pilot runs, one with Kenya and one with uh, Egypt and one with high schools in Canada. So we're sort of continuing to develop this. Uh, I'll skip through this slide. This is uh, uh, sort of some screenshots of, of the JAMI platform. It's multi-platform. Uh, part of that came from understanding that uh, we, uh, you know, when we were using a, initially a sort of a standard LMS, there was a lot of shortcomings with it, so we decided to try to build some of our own features. Uh, now we've expanded on into undergraduate education more. We've got options in engineering. In engineering, you can't have a minor. There's just not enough uh, elective space, but they can take a six-course option. It's again built around both enterprise co-op or commercializing their capstone projects. All fourth years do a capstone project. Uh, we've recently expanded that into a full eight course minor for the rest of campus. And we've also developed a program called BETS, which takes first year students and help, it gets them you know, placed with uh, undergrad or as uh, uh, short term projects with, with startup companies. 
Uh, some reflections, uh, a strong link between experiential learning and entrepreneurship activity. Uh, integrating entrepreneurship education, uh, integrating it into entrepreneurship education is important. You know, this, this idea that you have to experience it to really to learn about it. Uh, intellectual property policy is important at the graduate and faculty levels, but not really relevant at the undergrad level. So it's never really come into play. Educa entrepreneurship education itself is transformational. You're taking people and moving them from one mindset to another. It's not just about the courses, it's about developing the whole person, this whole uh, the sort of the, the motivational side of things, the, the soft side, uh, building motivation, self-efficacy. The context is important. You know, it, when you're providing the education, does it make sense for what they're doing at the time? 